All right, welcome back from our little break. Um, so we just proved that the context-free grammars are equivalent to the PDAs. Let's give a high-level view of where we are uh, picture-wise. So we have previously proven, oh my god, that's how nice this marker is, that the uh, DFAs uh, are equal to the NFAs, uh, which are equal to the regular expressions. Uh, then we proved that there were language, then we pumped out of the, we showed not every language was regular. We gave easily definable languages which were not computable by DFAs, palindromes, AD and BDN. But then we were able to give grammars and PDAs for these objects, CFGs and uh, PDAs. So we were able to show that uh, there were languages decidable by PDAs and not by uh, CFGs. Real quickly, though, we proved that every regular, every regular language is decidable by a CFG um, using uh, showing that every regular expression has a context-free grammar. But you can also show that every DFA has, a, excuse me, every NFA has a PDA. Just ignore the stack, right? So we get, uh, now we've shown that CFGs and PDAs are equivalent. So this is the picture of the world that we're at. Things that are, appear to be here are like a star. Uh, things that appear to be in here are things like uh, a to the n, uh, b to the n, or w, w, r, and so on. But we briefly mentioned, even though we didn't prove it, that there exist things that are not here. And one of, the, one of those things is going to be like a to the n, b to the n, uh, c to the n. That's an example of something that's not context-free. Um, we mentioned that you just kind of, when we talked about closure, uh, why this language was usefully not context-free. But it turns out that's what we're going to prove today. We're going to work up to building that there exists non-context-free languages. So we're going to develop uh, basically the pumping lemma. For uh, CFLs. So we're going to give them a context-free language. Given the recursive structure of a uh, CFG, we'll talk about things that they can't do. Yes? Is that context-sensitive? Uh, that one, I think, specifically is context sensitive. Right. Uh, and so it turns out that the context sensitive grammars, so like DFAs and NFAs correspond to algorithms of constant space. It's hard to quantify exactly what the CFGs and PDAs are, except themselves, CFGs and PDAs. Turns out that the context sensitive grammars correspond to algorithms of linear space, no more. So you use exactly the amount of space in the input, no dynamic programming or anything. You can't use more than your input. Um, linear space algorithms are, it turns out, the context sensitive. That's kind of not easy to prove, though. We may talk about it later. But, and there are things beyond content se context sensitive as well, right? Because certainly there are algorithms that don't use linear space. Dynamic programming stuff uses, uh, well, those dynamic programming problems do have constant space, exponential time. Let's not get into it. But yes, this, is, this happens to be context sensitive grammar. If you actually, if you go to the Wikipedia page for context sensitive, they, do, they give the grammar for this and the production kind of long and involved, right? It's not obvious. Um, we, proved the con we proved the pumping lemma for regular languages by talking about the pigeonhole principle for um, the computation of a DFA involved the sequence of states. We want to prove that uh, by similar argument that a f this kind of finite structure of a grammar, we'll do it on the grammars rather than the PDAs, um, but that the PDAs are, uh, excuse me, that the CFGs, that if you ask a CFG to prove, produce an arbitrarily long word, that somehow the pigeonhole principle is going to give you some kind of collision, and then using that, you can pump strings in the, in the, in the language. So the idea is actually quite intuitive, extremely intuitive. Um, but again, the proofs are always involved, right? So like, if suppose we have an, an extremely long word of a, and a grammar with not so many non-terminals, right? So like, consider the, a, a DFA, you can measure the number of states as like the size of the DFA. The grammar, you can suppose you measure the number of productions or the number of non-terminals, right? So like, um, consider a super long word, supper, super uh, long word on a small a grammar. 
So maybe, maybe the word has length a billion and the grammar only has like five non-terminals or something, right? If you consider a parse tree, recall that, uh, recall that a parse tree is like, uh, is like you have some non-terminal and then you draw with the lines like whatever the production goes to, right? Like you go ABC or whatever you, if you had production like ABC, right? And then B, maybe it was, if it was a non-terminal, it would go to something else, right? So I claim that if you have a long enough word on a small grammar, some non-terminal is repeated twice on a path in the uh, parse tree. So if we'll compute exactly how long the word needs to be, if you have a long enough word Um, its parse tree will contain a repeated a non terminal on some path. So, what this means is pictorially, let's say we have some T. And suppose this produces some sequence of things that have string R, that have non-terminal R. So as, as you, if you consider the sequence of working strings, somehow R appears. If at every production, you can't have no non-terminals that you've, you, you've never seen before if the string is long enough. Let's say you have five non-terminals and every step adds a new non-terminal. Uh, if you have string length a million, it's gonna take like, a, maybe it takes like a million productions or whatever. Um, eventually, a non-terminal is going to have to repeat in that working string. So we'll draw it this way, those R. So let's say uh, this is what our tree looks like, right? Let's say uh, whatever, uh, whatever T goes to something and then goes to R, let's say this produces some string U, and let's say this produces some string Z, right? So something like this. And these themselves may be like some tree, right? There may be some structure there, something like that, right? Um, R goes like this. I'll draw it a little higher up. So R appears twice. Then let's say when the production goes from R to the R the second time, uh, that this uh, produces some strings in the left and right. We'll call these V. We'll call this uh, Y. And then we'll say uh, R produces here X. You guys can hear the piano? There's a piano yeah. in the uh, atrium. Okay, I'm getting distracted. It probably didn't show up on the mic, but I'm getting, I'm getting distracted. Okay, so if this is a parse tree for UV XYZ. So like, we know that non-terminal T is going to produce string UV XYZ, right? Because this is what the tree looks like, okay? Um, R appears twice because, the t let's suppose R is the non-terminal which appears twice because the production takes very long. Suppose the tree is really, really tall and that, you know, if you have finitely many non-terminals but a tree that's arbitrarily large, certainly by the pigeonhole principle and we'll compute exactly what the conditions are for this to be necessary, some non-terminal has to appear twice, right? If the, if, the, if the string is long enough. If you consider how the productions actually worked, here, we chose to do a sequence of productions that produced VXY, but then the second time we saw R, saw R we chose to uh, have a set of productions which only produced uh, R here. So the first time, R produced um, like um, VRY, and the second time, R produced X, right? So this non-terminal produced two, two um, there was two different productions of this non-terminal, of the way, the way it came out. And if you think about it, here there's kind of like a self-loop. If you recall from the, uh, the pumping lemma for the regular languages, we had a self-loop from Y, basically through a sequence of states. Here is the same thing. We have R on the, R, we go from non-terminal R through a sequence of productions to R again somehow. If the, if the number of productions is arbitrarily long, finally many terminals, R is the non-terminal where this has to appear twice. I claim the following. 
if this is a valid production, valid sequence of productions, a valid grammar, then we can perform the following surgery. We perform the following surgery. What I'm going to do is just pretend that this time we took R, we took it a second time instead of producing X. So our parse tree would look like the following. Okay, see what I've done there? Just as a picture, as a proof, I basically, if R produces X here, I cut this part of the tree out, I copy this part of the tree where R produces VXY, and then paste it in here. Right? So if T produces, uh, so if T produces U, V, X, Y, Z, T also produces U, B squared, X, Y squared, Z. There's kind of our first hint of what this looks like analogous to the previous pumping lemma. We can, pr we can copy these v's and these y's as many times as we want, right, through, in, through this copy method, including zero times. Here we went t goes to r goes to r twice, and we, that was necessary for us to produce v, x, and y. We could do this in a way that we, instead of going t goes to r goes to r, we goes go this t to this r. So we delete this and copy this and put this up, and we won't have a v or a y here. We'll just have u, x, z. And that'll look something like this. So t goes to r. Right? Basically here, again, cut the tree here, perform the surgery, copy this here, and paste this here, and delete the rest of it. Right? So it's going to be UXC. So this is really the heart. Of course, it's more important to understand like, what's the point of the pumping lemma? What kind of combinatorial argument can you make on the structure? Rather than it is important, you know how to apply the pumping lemma and do problems. Right? I, other people who might teach this or something, they might care very rigorously about how you can apply the pumping lemma, how you can prove a language is not context-free by applying the pumping lemma. I don't care enough. I don't think like you knowing this one specific combinatorial argument Memorizing it makes you a good computer scientist, but I think understanding the reason the proof technique works is much more important here. The point was, I mean, the moral here was that we were able, the grammar is not really intuitive on how you can, like, work with it, right? It's really weird. So you have to somehow perform a, a pigeonhole argument on something, and here you have to look towards the parse tree. That's really the moral here. Performing the surgery in the parse tree gives you this. So basically, like uh, the idea is going to be like if uh, u v x y z is in L, uh, then uh, for all i u v x y z u to the i v uh, u v to the i x y to the i z is also in L. That's sort of the the the, the heart here. Any any context-free grammar is pumpable in this way. Any context-free language is pumpable in this way because the grammar should have this structure for it, us to abuse. But what's going to happen is like we're going to be able to take some string in the language, show it's not pumpable, show that there exists an I where it's not in the language, and then that will allow us to conclude that the language could not have been context-free. That is the point. Let me derive exactly the conditions we need uh, for this to be true. I want to make sure I don't mess this up. Uh, it's kind of finicky. So um, let B uh, be the length of the longest right-hand side of any production. 
So in Chomsky normal form, a grammar only has the longest length of the right-hand side of any grammar in Chomsky normal form is only length two. But let's consider arbitrary grammars. They, the productions may have a right-hand side lengths. The lengths of those, let's suppose the maximum is B. So B is the longest rule in the language. Um, in one uh, step, a grammar may produce a word of max length B, right? Well, in two steps, what's the longest word? So suppose the le right hand side of a, of, a, of a grammar had length B. What is the longest word that can be produced in, in two steps? The longest word that can be produced, first let's go for the first sentence. In one step, a grammar can produce a word of length B, maximally, right? So why? Suppose that rule was just like, goes to a string of terminals. No non-terminals in it for some reason. Weird grammar, but that's allowed. So the ma in one step, a grammar can only produce a string of maximum length B. Maybe it can produce no strings in length B in, in one step. What is the longest string that can be produced by a grammar in two steps? 2B. 2B minus 1. No, 2B. Let me make sure I got this right. Hold on. Well, how many nodes does a, does a uh, maybe in steps, maybe I shouldn't say steps, maybe I should say uh, in the, of a tree of height two? Because actually it, it would be, it wouldn't be two, it would be minus one and so on, correct. But consider the tree, we're going to uh, argue not on the number of productions, let me clarify myself, but on the height of the tree. So if a parse tree is height one, it can produce only a string of one production, it can produce a string of length B. If a parse tree is height 2, so you're allowed perhaps to do more productions, how many rules can you apply? How many, what's the longest string you can have? B squared. Yeah, B squared. Uh, it's going to be um, B squared, right? So maybe the first rule is like all non-terminals. Each of those non-terminals goes to a string of B terminals somehow. How many nodes like at each depth? Does the, the, does the tree have? It's going to be B, B, B squared, B cubed, and so on, right? So it may help to recall the master theorem from algorithms. So you guys remember something about that with some geometric series der derivations there? Okay, I want to make sure I get this exact, uh, exactly right. So we can do kind of the opposite. If a tree has height H, The max length string it can derive is what's the if a, if a tree has height h what's the longest string it can derive? Is the h? Yes. If a string has height, if a string has length of b to the h if this if a string has length b to the h plus one, what is the minimum length of its parse tree? So we know that if a string if a, if a tree has height h. It can't produce strings longer than b to the h, okay? Consider a string, though, b to the h plus 1. What's the minimum height of its parse tree? h plus 1. Yes. So if the, if the string has length b to the h plus 1, its parse tree has minimum height or depth uh, h plus 1. I just want to make sure I get this exact. We're going to, just for convention, uh, we set uh, P is equal to B to the H in the exponent plus one. Wait. Nope. Uh, the number of non-terminals uh, plus one. Now notice B, P, so 
it, when you're talking about um, like the regular language, the pumping lemma for regular languages, P was the number of states. So we can make that analogously. Here, it's kind of messier because we want to induct on like the, not induct, but like argue that no height, there is no parse tree of any height to produce the words that we want. Um, but it's messy when we keep, when we would call it like B to the H plus one. So what we want to do is just call it P, but we're going to call it P, uh, and we're just going to set P to B to the number of non-terminals plus one. Here's the thing, though. This is not the minimum sufficient condition we need, but it's okay because it's greater than that. So it's certainly if, you know, you have P pigeons, P plus one pigeons, P pigeonholes, certainly you have a collision, but you also have a collision if you have P plus two pigeons, right? So we're just choosing something slightly bigger for a reason that'll make sense later. But this is, it's certainly true that this is going to be greater than b to the v uh, plus 1. So the plus 1 here is in the exponent, the plus 1 here is at the bottom. We're just going to choose a bigger number just for, the, for, the, for a convention that will make sense later. So since, um, uh, Since G has a uh, V uh, non terminals, some uh, non terminal in the parse tree. I think that's Amelie. You guys heard the movie, seen the movie Amelie? French movie? No, I don't know. No, you guys are too young. This is like they were playing mind. the Star Wars one before. The where they're in the um, the cantina scene. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, they're flexing on something. Okay. Um, so if G has V non-terminals, some non-terminal in the parse tree is repeated more than once. If like the length of S is greater than P. Right. So if you choose a if you choose a string longer than p, and p again is just a variable, just to shorthand the proofs and everything, so we don't have to keep writing b to the v plus one. If you choose a long enough string, and this is a an overly sufficient condition for this to happen, then the parse tree is going to have a repeated uh, non-terminal in the depth, and then we get the kind of copy paste recurrence that we want. So that's the first condition, basically. V s has to be greater than or equal to p. Uh, we want to pump. We want to uh, pump uh, non-empty. We want to pump something non-empty. So what we're going to, again with the pumping lemma, if you pump something empty, it's kind of trivial. So we want to pump something non-empty for us to have a conclusion. So we require that uh, Vy uh, is greater than zero. And make sure that I'm having that. Yeah, Vy is greater than zero um, uh, for s is equal to uvxyz. So basically, what this means is both Vy can't be empty. At least one has to contain a symbol. Okay, they both they both can't be empty. One of them has to have a symbol. Not both of them. Both of them can't be empty. One of them has to have a symbol. Okay. By the way, from here you could derive the pumping lemma for regular languages as a special case of the pumping lemma for context-free languages, if you restricted the form of pumping on the parse trees of regular grammars, you would have v's to be non-empty and y to always be empty. Something like this. If you choose y to always be empty, it turns out you have a parse tree structure that looks like a regular grammar. Um, finally, um, there may be many... So when you do pigeonhole, there may be many repeated pigeons, right? There may be many holes with more than one pigeon. You have P plus one pigeons. You have P pigeon holes. There exists a pigeon hole with more than one pigeon. It doesn't tell you which pigeon hole it is, but we want to be able to restrict ourselves to like the last pigeon hole. So what we're going to do is, is add an extra condition. Um, we only want to focus on the last repeated uh, non-terminal.
So here in this picture, we looked at R and R, copy twice, but here there may be like a million other R's, right? Something like this. R, 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 R may be occurring a million times in here, whatever. We only want to focus on the last two times it appears. So like if R in the picture, if like R produces um, in some number of steps, like VXY, uh, we want this uh, tree to have height um, greater than or equal to uh, the size of V plus one, right? So we require, so we require uh, that VXY have length uh, less than or equal to B to the V plus one. But as defined, because we put the plus one in the exponent here, this is just uh, the, the P that we want. So that's why the reason we're, we're calling P that, so that we don't have to deal with B to the V plus one versus B to the V plus one, V plus one, right? So, uh, and of course this condition is gonna help us uh, restrict ourselves, certainly. So this is uh, the conditions of the pumping lemma. Now let's, let me give you the formula. By the formula, I mean like a set of conditions that are uh, like the formula. Like the, like, so again, the pumping lemma is always hard. It's as a proof technique, it's not as intuitive as contradiction or pigeonhole or induction or something. You know, a lot of proof techniques are very simple. The pumping lemma is not simple. Ever, because you have a for alls, it exists in a for all, and it exists, and sometimes you're nested, and you have all these cases, and it's really messy and complicated, and it's not really, really no, it's not really, it's not really intuitive. It's not smart. So what I'm going to do is give you what's called the recipe. The recipe basically, like, if you copy this recipe exactly, you cannot mess it up, and people always mess this up. So that's the reason I like to I phrase it like this instead of a, a, like a contradiction to something else. So one, uh, assume to the contrary some language L is a CFL. So assume to the contrary that the language is a CFL uh, with pumping length P. Now recall that we said the pumping length was actually B to the V plus 1 b to the v plus 1. Um, but when you start the proof, you get to just call it p, thankfully. 2, a choose s in L such that s, the length of s is greater than or equal to p. You're choosing a long enough string, and it has to be in the language. Uh, list cases uh, u v x y z with s is equal to u v x y z. So, how many ways can you break it up into these five parts? Uh, subject to that uh, uh, v y is not empty and uh, v x y. is less than or equal to p. So list all the cases where that's true uh, for all of them. Uh, for each case, choose uh, i and show uh, x, no, u, v to the i, x, y to the i, z is not in L. And I guess uh, five is you can just conclude. So again, messes people up. This is an existential. This is a for all. This is an existential, a nested existential, right? So it, there's a lot of a lot of moving parts going on. But this is the formula for um, show, proving a language is not context-free. If you copy this formula exactly, there's no way you can mess up. Now, when we actually, we're, of course we're going to do some examples, but when you actually do them, they're actually much harder than the pumping limit for regular languages. It'll make sense why it's harder when we do it. But basically, like, you can either do it, 
with a million cases, or you can do it using kind of logical English in a way that it makes sense that your cases are total. So this is something that I'm not going to test on in any way, because your exam is actually today um, in 30 minutes. But uh, it's, uh, it's quite involved to get good at this. So uh, we're going to prove, of course, the language that I've been talking about so much, a to the n, uh, b to the n, uh, c to the n, uh, n is a natural number is not regular, excuse me, is not context free. So uh, what we're first going to, so intuitively, why is this not context free? Like a context free grammar is really able to keep track of one thing at a time. Think of it as this, the stack. We've proved CFTs are equivalent to PDAs now. So think of it like how you decide this with a stack, OK? You'd read the A's, and then you have to pop them out to match to the B's. But then you don't have, you didn't store it. You had to delete it in order to read it. So now you have nothing to match to the C's, right? Or even if you match the A's to the C's, how do you keep track of the B's? So in some sense, a context-free language requires keeping track. It, it, the context-free languages are exactly the things where you can keep track of exactly one thing at a time in a destructive way. If you need to read some stored variable twice, it doesn't work. It deletes itself in some way. You can think of the stack like, as a, if you think of the stack like a counter. This intuitively... Any program you could write to decide this language, like you take an input and you want to check if it has this form or not, requires checking like two things at once. Right? If you think of a program to write this, there's not really an easy, there's not a way I could think of to do it without like looping, counting the A's, checking the B's, whatever. Maybe you do split, you know, something complicated that doesn't follow a PDA or CFG. Um, so intuitively, it is uh, not context free, but let's prove it. Uh, assume to the contrary. Uh, L is context free. L is a CFL with pumping length uh, P. Two, uh, we're going to choose S. Now, normally in the regular languages, when you choose a bad S, it just means the proof is harder. Context free pumping lemma, you choose a bad S, you might not be able to finish the proof. Well, you want to choose an S that is so barely in the language that any perturbance, recall we're going to pump it. So any perturbance, you delete a symbol, you add a symbol, anywhere in the string should bring it out of the language. So you want a string that's like barely in the language. Here, there's only one obvious choice. What should we choose for S? B to the P, B to the P, C to the P. Yeah, it's going to mirror our argument. It's going to mirror our, it's going to mirror our argument uh, for A to the N, B to the N is not regular. Certainly, um, notice that it is true that S is in L, and the length of S is greater than or equal to P. That is certainly true. The length of S is 3P. Now, when we did the pumping lemma for regular languages, we, were, we could restrict ourselves to the prefix of the word. We could force that X, Y were always in the, like this A block here, and that we could guarantee that they're always the same. Here, however, the pumping lemma is U, V to the I, X, Y to the I, Z. And we want to pump v and y. But our restriction is that vxy is less than equal to p, not u. So we can't force this small block to be at the beginning of the string. It's just got to be somewhere in the middle. So all the key, consider how many cases there are for v and y to be in this string. Okay, v and y could both be in a. v and y could both be in b. v and y could both be in c. v, and, v, v could be in a. v could be and y could be in b. V could be in B, Y could be in C. Notice, though, that by this restriction, V, X, Y less than equal to P, it's important here that you notice that V could not be in A while Y is not in C. Okay? They're P apart. So V cannot contain an A while Y contains a C. They're way too far apart because this substring has length uh, at most P. So they're, they're, if they're P, those are P apart. So you, you, it's impossible. They could both be in B and C. They could both be in A and B. You know, or they could, one of them could be in between here. One of them could be in between here. So there's like 20 cases to do. Instead of writing out all the cases, what you want to do is write up the cases. Group All the cases are, there's going to be like a million cases, but they're going to be identical sounding. So you want to group them using natural English in a way that you know, they, they line up. So here's the, here's the uh, cases. Uh, case, uh, it's, I call it like a meta case. 
meta case one of V, Y, uh, each only contain one symbol. So maybe they contain different symbols, but they each only contain one symbol. So V and Y do not straddle A's and B's or B's and C's. Okay? Each VY is entirely in a block. Right? So this groups together, for example, VY is an A and B or B and C. Right? And anywhere V is in the A's, Y is in the B's, you know, whatever is in between them. Right? X would be, of course, in between V and Y. Right? So just consider all the cases where this is true. Um, well, there is three of A, B, C, and only two of B, Y, right? So there's three symbols, only two of them. So U, B to the I, X, we'll choose V squared. So we'll say, choose I equals 2. Choose I equals 2. Uh, U, B squared, X, Y squared, Z will have inflated um, at most two of uh, ABC, but not all three. So you have to use words with these proofs. Um, if you inflate V and Y, you pump them up, it's going to increase the A's, it's going to increase the A's, it's going to increase the, or it's going to increase the B's, or it's going to increase the C's. Or it's going to increase the A's and the B's, or the B's and the C's, or the, but not the A's and the C's, and certainly not all three. Okay? There are any pump, this string is barely in the language. Any pump up of this is going to have, the strings in this language have exactly the number of A's, B's, and C's. Right? When you pump this up, you will get more of one than the other. Right? So what does that mean? That means um, uh, that U, V squared, X, Y squared, Z cannot be in L, right? You can only pump up two of the things, but not all three. Meta case two, you want to cover all cases. So you want to take, make sure that your cases logically are universal and they're total. So what you can do then is take the kind of the logical complement of your other case to get the case that you want. So what is the logical complement of this case? So the, by, by, what do I mean by that? This meta case corresponds to all the cases where V and Y only contain one symbol. Any case that is not in this group of meta cases has what human sentence property? V and Y contain not one symbol? Yes. So like none or greater than one? Yes. Uh, the way you word it is, so here we assume both V and Y. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, yeah. Again, I'm just, I'm just asking this question because it is tricky. Both V and Y each contain only one symbol. So meta case two, at least, maybe both of them, at least one of, contain more than one symbol. Well, we mean, what we mean by that is like uh, V straddles the midpoint between A and B. So V contains A's and B's, or V contains B's and C's, or Y contains A's and B's and something like this, right? Choose I equals 2. What do you know then about U, V squared, X, Y squared, Z? So if V or Y contain more than one symbol, what is the contradiction here? So, V to the 2, does that mean two copies of V, right? Yes. So, let's just assume it's general. Let's say our st string is like A, 
A, B, B, okay? C, C, right? Here is our substring uh, V. Here is U. Here is whatever, X, Y, Z. Forget the other ones, just focus on V. V contains A's and B's, right? Like that. Would there be like too many of A's and B's to make it A to the N, B to the N? There is actually a different contradiction because what if Y here somehow pumps up the C's, the exact number that, let's say V pumps up the A's and the B's, can Y pump up the C's? It can't, it turns out, but you know, there's another argument here that's better, actually. You want the shortest, more, most sufficient argument. I think that would work, actually, you know, thinking about it another extra half second. But there's another argument. So we consider like U, V, V, X, Y, Z. What does that look like? Oh, would it be like there's A, B, and then A, B? So yes. So it would be like you split it? So, so that means if V and Y, are whatever, one of them isn't empty. Whatever the one isn't empty overlaps more than one of them. Uh, uh, an A comes after a B. Or a B comes after a C or something like this. Whatever. Or whatever general form of that is. Uh, it's out of order. So we say U, V, X, Y, Z is out of order. And then not in L, right? So like, again, just to be clear here, U, V, V, X, Y, Z is going to be like A, A, K, B, L, A, K, B, L, right? And this is something... But then there's a B coming before the A because this is the U, this is the V, this is the V, right? Now that you've seen one argument where it's out of order, you should be able to see substring kind of math uh, when it's out of order as well. So we ch those are the two meta cases uh, for this one. So for each meta case, we chose an I and we sh we were able to pump it, right? So here we can conclude. Uh, that L is not a CFL. Any questions on this example? These are all the cases. Yes. Convince yourself that these are all the cases. Every case that's in, that's very important that you that you convince yourself these are all the cases, right? Why are they all the cases? Take notice that the that the two meta cases are logical complements of each other, right? right? So every case has to be in one or the other. Every, either U, V, and Y are both all the same symbol, or one of them has more than one symbol. That's really the meta case. I'm going to prove one more uh, CFL here. And this is one that we didn't talk about too much, except at the beginning. It's W, W, uh, it's just that W is in sigma. So, WWR was regular and not regular and context-free. WW, it turns out, is not even context-free, right? If you think about it, WWR is context-free because the stack has to pop out in one way. There's no way for the stack to pop out the string, reverse it, and then look at it. As it pops it out, it loses it. It's gone into the ether, it forgets. It doesn't have the memory capability to remember WW. So, uh, there are many actually bad, terrible choices of S for this language. And I would encourage you uh, to work through this proof again with some of those bad choices. But I have the premonition to know what a good choice of S is. So I'm going to choose, uh, well, assume to the contrary, that L is a CFL with pumping length P, uh, choose S equals 0 to the P, 1 to the P, 0 to the P, 1 to the P. Again, many bad choices of S you can make, and I encourage you to work them out. But here, I know that for a fact this choice of S is going to work. Okay? Notice then that S is an L, because it is of the form WW, and... Um, the length of S is greater than or equal to P because it's defined in terms of P. Meta case one. 
So I wouldn't expect you to be able to come, with this, come up with this on your own, uh, which is why I'm doing it as an example, as a demonstration. So meta case one, uh, VXY is all in one half or the other. So the two meta cases are going to be VXY is all in one half, all in the second half, or it straddles the middle. That's the meta case here. So suppose VXY is all in one half. So it's all over here somewhere or all over here. So we're going to choose I equals 2. Then uh, UB squared X, Y squared Z is going to be what? Suppose this equals like uh, uh, W1, uh, W2, and we want to show, so we split the string in half. We want to show that the pump string is not in the language, so we'll show that W1 does not equal W2, right? So if you just suppose that we inflated the first half, suppose we inflated the, uh, without, without loss generality, suppose we pumped up the first half. So somehow VXY is in here somewhere. As we inflate this, the midpoint is going to move this way some, right? So it doesn't matter where we inflate it. If the zeros are the ones, we're pushing ones on that side. So what that means is, uh, so W1 begins with a zero, but W2 begins with a one, right? So before, WW begins with a zero, begins with a zero. By inflating this, we've pushed a one onto that side. So W2 has no choice but to begin with a one, making it different than W1, right? Similarly, uh, if we pumped the second half. Right? So that's the meta case all of one done, right? So what's the, what's the second meta case? Um, VXY straddles the middle. So if VXY straddles the middle, uh, we're going to choose an I that allows us to break this. Now, it might be the case that you could pump this up and maybe still break it. But it might be hard to argue what that conclusion is. So instead, you want a clean proof. I know by premonition that we're going to pump down. Choose uh, i equals 1. Oh, excuse me. No, i equals 1 is given. Choose i equals 0. i equals 0. Uh, if, if it straddles the middle, then uh, u, v to the 0, x, y to the 0, z. Because V and Y are not empty, this is going to somehow be only in the middle part. But it can't be in the, it won't touch this zero block and it won't touch this one block. VXY being less than or equal to P means it's in this middle somewhere. So it can't touch here if it's touching the midpoint as well, because they're too far apart. So this is going to be equal to zero to the P, one to the K, zero to the J, one to the P, where... Well, do we agree? First, that's, that's the case. If we're in the middle and we pump down, so where uh, we delete some of maybe some of 1 and maybe some of 0. We don't touch these two blocks, though. But if this is the case, um, uh, this is true where k, j, uh, both uh, can't be equal to why are they both not equal to P? Are K and J both not equal to P? Oh, wait, like, why can they not be equal to P? So both not equal to P, yeah. So suppose they were both equal to P. Then it would be, like, it would be a valid... That, yeah, right? it basically, basically what I'm trying to hint at is like if K and J were both P, then the pump did nothing, yeah. which means the pump was empty. But we assume that VY is not equal to zero, right? 
See, it's not even said, but it's, it's there. So K, J, both can't be P, right? So, but, uh, but uh, 0 to the P, 1 to the K, 0 to the J, uh, 1 to the P is equal to W, W, if and only if K equals J equals P. Convince yourself that that's true. That this string is only of the form w w if uh, k equals j equals p. But since we have to pump, we have to remove something non-empty. It's it's out of the string. That's why choosing s was very important here. We chose an s that was barely in the language. You perturb it slightly. Uh, it doesn't matter where you perturb it, but when you perturb it slightly, it, it brings it out of the language. So. Uh, so you. Uh, u, v, 0, x, y, 0, z is not in L. Uh, so we conclude that L is not a CFL. So there is no context-free language. Uh, there is no context-free grammar to give you uh, w, w by pumping. All right, any questions? Okay?